So this is our framework. Um, it has been written in collaboration with various people, uh, mainly someone called Cedric Mason, who has done a PhD in soil science and has been involved in some USDA uh, data collection. We met at Via Organica, which is uh, the second camp we ran in Mexico last year. And we were trialing some of these tests at that camp. Um, it's only been used as it was intended to be used, i.e. by people going to camps and collecting the data from it in the last couple of months. So it's still quite a new endeavor for us to be collecting data at the camps using this framework. And we intend for every time a research officer goes to a camp and uses the framework, we want to get thorough feedback from them on how they found it so that we can constantly be improving this. Um, the challenging thing with collecting data at the camps at the moment is that the camps themselves don't have a lot of money. So we had to design data collection methods that would be low cost and capable and everyday people could be capable of, of collecting this data because the, ho the whole point of our movement is to empower everyday people. Um, so it was designed with those two things in mind. Um, so that being said, let's run through it. So yeah, the first section looks at why we need to collect data, what the difference between monitoring evaluation is and an introduction to how the framework works. So yeah, we need to collect data because we want to measure our impact. We want to see what is and isn't working. And then we want to be able to share these lessons and impact stories with the world to prove that our model works and to attract more support. And the difference between monitoring and evaluation, monitoring is continuous collection of data over time and evaluation is looking at the data and drawing conclusions from it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so on this page here, you can, page four, is the framework itself laid out in a table. Um, and you can see there are three sections. There's a section called soil, one called soul, and one called society. Soil refers to all of the ecological data collection methods. Uh, soul refers to the personal change that happens within the people that go there, so the campers. And campers refer to people that live there and work there every day and people that come in from outside. And then society refers to the wider society around the camp. Um, so people that live in the community surrounding where the camp is. Uh, yeah, so that's how the framework is structured. We can see that there are three sections and three columns across the top. So the outcomes refer to what we want to see happen at the camp, at the camps. So for instance, the first outcome for the soil section, soil referring to all of the ecolog ecological changes we want to see, is increased soil carbon. Um, Obviously, it's important for us to know how the soil carbon is increasing because so much there's so much potential to sequester carbon into soils to mitigate climate change. Um, and a lot of people are putting a lot of emphasis on this as a, a natural climate solution. So we want to show that the, our camps are working towards that. Um, and the indicator means what do we need to see to know that we're achieving the outcome? So for instance, the indicator for the first outcome is the soil organic matter and carbon have increased 
since the baseline. So the way then we move on to the next column, means of verification, how are we going to assess whether the indicator has happened so that we can see whether the outcome has happened. Mm -hmm. And the loss on ignition lab test is the most common way of measuring um, soil organic matter. So you need to find a lab, basically. Um, there is a way of doing it without a lab, which is essentially just using, it's a, it's a more rudimentary way of doing what they do in a lab. So you get a, a very high temperature flame, like a Bunsen burner or a camping stove. Yeah. And you just burn off the organic matter and then you weigh it. So you're, you're getting a weight. And I have um, asked someone that I've been working with for a long time on various ERC stuff. He's a, he's a sustainability teacher and he knows of a way to measure this without using a lab, but it, the efficacy of it hasn't really been studied as to how effective this method is in comparison to a lab. But if you don't have a lab, we could consider doing it this way. And it's actually something that I need to do. I need to chase him up because he said he was going to write the protocol for how to do it. And then I'm going to put it into this framework just in case there's no lab available nice. so yeah I'm going to write that down as a to-do list because I need to do that chase Toby about loss on ignition test without lab or framework so yeah one of the things you'll need to do when you get there is to assess is there a, a soil testing lab near me <laughs> Um, and how much does it cost? And then once you have worked, once you've worked out the organic matter levels, then there's a simple equation you can do to work out what the organic carbon level is. Um, and seeing as you're going into a project that's already been going for a while, rather than doing a baseline at the actual sites that are being restored, you'll have to find some control sites. Do you know what that means? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So where the intervention is not happening, right? Yeah, you're looking for sites that have the same conditions as the ones that are being restored, that are not, that are close by, where you can take, you can do the same tests to compare the difference. Mm, okay, so then, because, uh, uh, so there's no baseline now and as you said i mean the, at least a uh, first phase of the project already happened uh, i think yeah. also the end of last year so this is how then you would yeah like that what you would get at the control side would be could be used as baseline there in that in that case yes okay yeah, exactly um quite a few camps have already done a fair bit of work without doing any monitoring so mm -hmm. if you don't have a baseline you just find a site that is has the same conditions as the one that was being uh, that's being restored mm -hmm. and collect data from there and then when you're assessing the data if there are any differences at all then you need to factor those in or at least mention them okay um, so I think what would be useful is to go to the uh, go to the actual explanation of the test and then flip back to the framework. Um, but another thing that is useful to do when, mo when monitoring before we go into the actual means of verification listed here is to take a lot of photographs um, using the fixed point photography method or a drone depending on which one you have access to so fixed point photography is really simple you just find a point um on the landscape that is uh that sticks out so for instance it could be a mountain 
peak or a tree that you've marked in some way and then you just take photos from that point and then you make sure that the point that you've taken the photo from is marked somehow so you can either use a uh, like a metal pole that's been painted some sort of color or something and then if you create a google map where and the place the points where you've put the markers if that makes sense so what i recommend is creating google map and then on the sides of the map you have lists of different points and you label them according to the tests so you could have a point on the map and then on the side of the google maps where you've list where you label your points you say before and after pictures or fixed point photography point one does that make sense yeah, and then yeah, on the yeah. Google map you'll have lots of different points of where you've taken the photographs from and then the following year whoever is doing the data collection for that year will take the photos from the same positions and then over time we'll be able to see changes in the landscape cool clear great um yeah so on this page here on page five this section is running through the different elements of the framework uh, where the ecological outcomes are concerned and basically just explaining why it's important to be measuring these things so we're measuring an increase in soil carbon uh, a decrease in soil compaction a decrease in soil erosion or, a, or an increase in soil accumulation, which is essentially the same thing. Mm. Um, increased water retention capacity of the soil and increased biodiversity and increased soil health. So yeah, these sections just explain why it's important to be measuring these things, but um, I'm sure you already know that, the reasons why. And then the social outcomes, We'll come back to in a minute because I think we should just focus on the ecological ones first, otherwise we're going to get a bit skewed. Um, so yeah, then it then it comes down to explanations of how to do each of the tests. So this one refers to the organic matter content being higher than the baseline level. It explains which test you're doing, and then it basically explains how you do it so you're collecting soil samples it tells you wh what kind of equipment you need so i think what's important to do is to go through the framework and make a list of all of the equipment you'll need mm. and send it to menno or send it to whoever your camp coordinator is seeing as other people will be watching this video and make sure that they are aware in advance of what's needed because you don't want to get there and then it takes a month to get all of the equipment you want to arrive and the equipment be there already yeah um and most of the things are really simple and cheap and easy to get the only thing that's kind of a bit more challenging to find is a you need a you need yellow washing up bowls for the insect test. And the reason you need yellow color is because that attracts insects more, that color, because they see it as pollen. Um, and you might think, oh, finding a yellow washing up bowl is easy, but you know, it's not, because it's not guaranteed you're gonna go into the nearest hardware store and they'll just definitely have yellow ones. Um, but we'll get to that in a minute. So yeah, here are all the instructions for how to collect soil samples. I'm not going to read them out because it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, so the first test is collecting the soil samples and finding a lab to send them to. The next test is called the water holding capacity test. And this is a test that measures the water holding capacity of the soil. This is important because we want 
uh, especially in drier areas, considering that the earth is getting drier and drier, we want the soil to hold as much water as possible. There is a definitely a correlation between the organic matter levels in the soil and how much water it can hold. There's a really cool statistic that I actually have pinned up on my wall that says every 1% of organic matter content in the soil stores 20,000 gallons of water. So every, the more and more that you're increasing the organic matter level, hmm. you're increasing the, the um, amount of water that the soil can hold. And the more water that the soil can hold, the more vegetation, the ecosystem can support the more vegetation there is the more biomass the more fauna the more life more biodiversity better it's just better that's what we want so yeah starting off with um how much assessing how much water the soil can hold uh is a good way of knowing how well the ecosystem's doing basically and it's quite simple to do this test um the thing that you really need the most is an oven um that can get up to 105 degrees centigrade uh that's the most important thing that you'll need for this test so locating one of those is something you'll need to ask menno about yeah i was thinking exactly about that because the way he explained like once we are on the side it's very so there is a like a small house there where it's very 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 basic i don't I'm not, i don't think they will have an oven mm. so i would need to ask him whether like it would be possible to have access to an oven somewhere close to there so then i thought because then he said cochabamba is not far but then i don't know for how long i could take like bring the samples there and until i get access to an oven i don't know how much that would affect the the test so i need to double check with him but i may need to come back to this one with you like yeah yeah that's a good question actually i can always ask cedric the person who wrote this test to see what he says um yeah why don't you ask menno where he thinks you could get hold of an oven and um and then We'll go from there. Okay, sure. So this test essentially is picking a number of sites, selecting at least three sites and marking them out. Um, and then take the, remove the vegetation from a one by one meter squared patch. But you're picking three sites across the area that you're restoring, the area that's being restored. And you want to try and pick areas that are indicative of different methods of uh, restoration or different elevations. You know, you, you want three different areas that are exemplary of the site as a whole. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So you remove the vegetation and then you create a one meter wide, one meter space and you have to soak the soil until the water will no longer be saturated. So you, as, uh, you have to completely saturate the soil with water, basically. Hmm. Once you've done that, once the soil can no longer absorb any more water, cover it with a plastic sheet and pin it down and wait for 48 to 72 hours and the sheet will prevent evaporation so essentially you're just you want the soil to absorb the, as much water as it physically can uh, then you remove the plastic sheet take a sharp spade cut the soil sample um, so that you have a slice of soil and then you mix them together so that you have an average mix the soil samples together and then you take three to six cups of the mixed sample and put it into a pan. And then you, you weigh the soil with the water in it. Hmm. Then you have to bake it so that the water's evaporated. Yeah. And then weigh it again. That's as simple as that, basically. And then that will give you 
the water holding capacity. Um, so yeah, there were a couple of other people at the camps at the moment who have done this test and they came across a few challenges with it. So what I'm thinking actually would be good. When are you planning on going? So at the moment, I have a ticket to Colombia because I'm going there first, but I think mid June, I, I expect to be in Bolivia. June? Yeah, uh, sorry, what am I saying? No, mid January. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so before you go, maybe in the next month or so, I'm gonna organize a call with you. And there's another woman called China who wants to go to the camp in France in January. Okay. And I'll, I'd like to organize a call with you two and then the two data collection officers that are doing the data collection at the moment so that you can learn directly from how it went for them. Great. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so the next test is about soil erosion. So we want to see that soil erosion is decreased and that you are actually accumulating soil rather than uh, it being eroded. And this test is very simple. All you need is some sort of marker that's like a, a pole that's not going to biodegrade. Hmm. So what um, what the camp in Guatemala does is just gets like thick threaded bolts from a hardware store, sort of like big screws. Okay. Big metal, um, and spray paint. And that's it. So they, you select six spots around your site that best reflect the different management styles you're working on, preferably on contour lines. Mm -hmm. Do you know how to measure contour lines of mm -hmm. a site? So I have a little training video on how to create a contour line map. Okay. Um, but I imagine that the camper that was there last year, Ben, would yeah. have already done this. Yeah, 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 I think he did. So find the contour lines on the site and then see if any uh, kind of soil erosion and water collection, water collection, <laughs> water collection or catchment earthworks have been put in place. Hmm. Like swales, dams, gabions, anything like ponds, anything like that. Uh, and then you're going to put these threaded bolts in places where you imagine that soil is going to accumulate or run off from. Um, put the poles into the ground and then mark them with the spray paint so that you know where the soil level is. Yep. And then that's it. And then a year later, someone will come and look at them again and either the level soil level will be lower or it'll be higher. And that will show whether the soil is accumulating or decreasing. And then you just need to mark the soil level again a year later with spray paint. Okay. Um, <clears throat> soil compaction. So a lot of soils are compacted, especially if they have had their vegetation removed regularly um, or they've been ploughed or they've been regularly walked over. Um, and compaction is a major cause of desertification and decompacting the soil is often a really effective way of getting more water and oxygen into the ground to the plant's roots and to enable more vegetation to survive and thrive. Um, and the, way, the easiest way to measure soil compaction is with something called a penetrometer which is sort of like a uh, it's got handles yeah and you push it into the ground and then it has a pressure gauge on it yeah okay um and it will give you a psi reading okay. same as when you're pumping up your tire bike tires yeah yeah um and you'll end up with a result between zero and 400 psi the higher the PSI, the higher the compaction, and you should be aiming for a PSI of around 200. 
that's that's sort of the right level of soil pressure you're looking for um so yeah you you're you basically mark out six points around the site mark them with markers label them with numbers and put them on your google map and then measure the psi count at the sites and and label you can create a little table so the campsite number label number and psi count yeah uh, uh, actually i just noticed that this is an updated uh, version of the yeah so yeah just to rem yeah uh, please share with me i will it's it's okay. now up on the website again oh okay cool. um so where you found it on the website last time under our impact the, this is the updated version indeed um but this is pretty straightforward the penetrometer is probably the most expensive uh piece of equipment that this test suggests you use apart from the soil samples um they're around two hundred dollars hmm. so apparently menno has seen the framework and has agreed to the costs um but it's probably going to be really difficult for you to find one of these in bolivia so i would suggest talking to him about getting one before you leave yeah and then uh bringing it with you mm -hmm. Is that clear? Yeah, it is clear. Okay. Uh, the next test is measuring biodiversity using transects. We're using plants and insects as two species or two families of species to uh, use as indicators for biodiversity changes. So a transect is essentially you just picking out areas of your site using a, a kind of big square. <laughs> so you're, you're creating like a massive picture frame, basically, yeah. that you're then just putting down on the ground and everything within that picture frame you're recording. So the plant diversity, Imagine you pick a number of sites around the uh, around the area. Six is often a good number, and you're selecting them based on the. I mean, I don't know exactly what the sites are going to be like, but if there's a range of different ecosystem types, there could be a, like a, a slopey area. There could be an area that's um, higher elevation, an area that's got north facing south facing so i know it's quite a mountainous area there isn't it um maybe you want to find an area at the top of the slope halfway down the slope at the bottom of the slope on the north face or the south face depending on which side gets more sun you want to pick areas that are all indicative of different growing conditions hmm. it's something that if i could once i'm there well i don't, I, don't, I think that those could be somehow selected even before I go, if we understand the topography of the place. But is that something that you can advise with? Like once I have a better understanding of it, that I could get some advice from you? Like, yeah, from all of this, maybe better take it here, here and there? Uh, yeah, it would be easier for me to do that if you have internet connection there. I don't know if you will. Um, but another thing that you could do actually i'm creating another little training for how to get the polygons from a site a polygon mm -hmm. is, is do you know what a polygon is yeah 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 so i don't think this has been done at chikai yet but i might be mistaken maybe ben did it but if you can get the polygons uh to me then I can send them. We're working with this man called Mikhail, who is a GIS mapping specialist. And oh, nice. he, once he has the polygons, he should be able to look at the site and tell you uh, about the elevation, about erosion, vegetation cover, that sort of thing. So we could help you pick sites once we have those maps. Okay. 
So I, once the uh, there's a guide basically being created for how to do polygon, find the polygons for the site, and once that's finished, I'll send it to you. Great, thank you. Sorry, can because you mentioned this was quite important. I, I you, there is a yellow washing something that I'm that is supposed to be used for this. Uh, the next uh, test, the, we'll get to that. In and a the next one. Oh, okay, great. I thought it was just all you need for this test is something to make the frame out of and you want it to be one meter by one meter squared yeah. size so it can be pieces of wood um pieces of bamboo hmm. doesn't really matter what it's made of um ideally it would be the the size would be straight it'd be straight edges um so yeah whatever you can get your hands on basically maybe it'd be good to talk to menno about this to see what he thinks you could use uh i'm really not sure what how you know what sort of shops there are in cochabamba but that's something to ask him about um you'll need a camera but your do you have a smartphone with a decent camera on it um i have a smartphone i'm not sure i mean it's not a the latest phone but okay but it's got good enough camera right yeah yeah i guess so see. um and so you're you you create your transect frame mm -hmm. you select the sites that are indicative of different areas of the site or different management styles so say there could be like an agroforestry area, there could be like a native native vegetation area. You just, you want to create a sample of the site basically when you're selecting your areas. You put the transect down on the ground and then within that frame, you'll have a number of different species of plants. Now I'm not expecting you and other research officers to know exactly what all of the plants are if you do if there is someone in the area that is that has a good knowledge of the local plants and botany and they would like to help you then fantastic so maybe there's someone in the village that you know knows all of the local plants and can tell you what they are but basically we want to know the number of different species that's that's essentially it and you don't need to know what they are but you can mm. tell that they're different because they look different yeah um and if there is a local botanist you can identify the different species then that would be even better but it's i know it's a big ask so we just want the number of different species pre present within your transect does that make sense yeah that makes sense Fantastic. Um, okay, then this is where the yellow washing up bowl comes in. This is the second biodiversity test um, and it's to do with insects. So how long are you there for? I will be there for three months. Okay. Are you familiar with the climate of the area that you're going to? And uh, no, but I understand it will be summer. I know it's very high up, yeah. like 38 or 4,000 meters high, but, and, but it's sort of summer. So I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't looked into that like, fully yet. The reason I asked is because there's a, there tends to be a time in the year where there are more insects around. Okay. Um, and what that is in Bolivia, I'm not sure, but Menno and the, certainly the local partner will know. Hmm. Um, so throughout your time there, find the best time for doing this test based on when the most insects are around. I mean, yeah. in, in Europe, it will be late spring and uh, late spring and summer, for instance. Um, in the tropics, it will be during the monsoon in uh in 
Mexico, I know it's, you know, when the rains come. So it could be that you're not there at the ideal time. Hmm. Um, in which case, we might try and find a way to be there at the right time, but it's just, it's still worth doing the test anyway. Okay. Um, so the, this is called a pitfall trap. There are lots of different types of insect uh, biodiversity tests you can do, and they trap different insects. Um, so what I'm realizing from feedback from um, Michaela, who's the data collector at Campata Plano in Spain, she was saying that the pitfall traps are not really catching that many insects. Um, and that is a due to the time of year. I mean, it's November now and most insects are around in like May to August. So yeah. it will be done again next year at the right time. But it's also showing that there are lots of different types of insects and this test only attracts certain types. So I'm going to be working with an intern from Wageningen University who will be looking into all of the other different types of tests that you can use to attract insects and maybe adding some more to the framework. Um, so just to let you know, there probably will be some more insect tests added. Okay. Um, but this one, essentially, you just have you dig up, you dig holes, you, you select sites, again, three sites that are indicative of different management styles and different ecosystem types. Dig a hole to the depth of the bowl. So say the bowl is 30 centimetres deep, you dig a 30 centimetre deep hole, put the bowl in it so that if a, an insect is walking along the ground, it will fall in. Um, the bowls need to be yellow because this is what this is the colour that attracts the most insects. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a mixture of water, molasses, uh, which is a type of agricultural, agriculturally used sugar. It's like less processed brown sugar. Soap or detergent. So like washing up liquid or something or like powdered soap is also good. Um, tweezers and a toaster. Again, you need an oven for this to like dry the insects out. Ashley, is there any, do you have any recommendation for the size of the bowl, diameter or? You know, the no, area? standard washing up bowl size is fine. Um, and they're normally like, again, around 30 to 40 centimeters in size. You know, like a standard sink size washing up bowl. Ah, okay. The bowl, sort of know. bowls you put inside a sink to do the washing up with. Yeah, ah, okay, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean now. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you, you create the mixture, which is water, molasses and soap. The, the sugar attracts the insects and the soap keeps them in there. Um, place them around the land, wait three days, uh, pick the bowls out, clean the insects from the soap. You can use a sieve. Um, and then count the number of different species and record how many species you found um, and then dry the insects and then weigh them. So we want the total insect biomass as well as how many species you found. Okay. And you record your results. All right. Uh, the next test is called the Soil Your Undies test, and it's essentially just finding some cotton underwear uh, without any dye or any polyester, so it has to be 100% cotton. Again, this might be something that you'll need to get before you go um, and take with you. And all you're doing is you're burying it in the ground um, and marking where you've put it and then you're going to leave it for 60 days again you should be doing all of these tests on the site that you're restoring and the control site so you're compa constantly comparing the two yeah um 
and then you dig up the the underwear and then the level of composition the amount of composition that has happened to the cotton will indicate how active the soil food web is so how much fungi bacteria protozoa nematodes all of the stuff that's in healthy soil how much of it is present and the, you'll be able to see that by the level of decomposition so this is not a, a completely scientifically watertight test but it's a really good way of showing soil health okay you can hold up a pair of underwear that's completely disintegrated and you can hold up a pair that's barely and then you can say this one came from this the restoration site and this one didn't it's it's purely just to show via an image what the soil is doing but it's a very simple and basic test it's the sort of thing that primary schools do <laughs> um but i still like it hey one question so given that uh, some of these tests require uh, like being done like different sites can in a site i can do like many tests would that would that doesn't really matter right or would for the, it for this one uh they only mention doing one pair of underwear but i mean you normally when you buy underwear in the uk anyway you can get like packs of six uh so you could just buy a pack of six and do it six times it's up to you no, uh, okay, that's clear. But what I meant was, in in the one side, I can do the insect, the, the underwear, this and that. So, so I can perform different tests on the same side, and then just have maybe you would identify five to six sides. Yeah. Then you can. Okay. Yeah. Because you're going to be coming back to the same areas every time anyway. Because you're for every test, you want to pick sites that are indicative of different landscape topographic topographical uh, aspects as mm -hmm. well as the different types of ecosystems that may exist on the site yeah. so you're always going to be coming back so you could have a cluster of air of tests happening in mm -hmm. in different areas that's fine okay clear makes it easier for you as well mm. um so yeah that is the end of the ecological data collection methods. Um, do you have any questions? Uh, not at the moment. I think, uh, as I said, uh, well, as you suggested, if we would have a call with this other person uh, later that can just give us maybe the tips and tricks on the, yeah, uh, on how to do this test, maybe, yeah, this person can share, we can ask more questions, but at the moment, I'm, I, I'm okay. Right. Uh, so yeah, sorry, just being uh, yeah aware of, of the time. I think one of the questions that I remember having uh, about this ones because they are mostly like qualitative uh, methods with surveys, questionnaires. I was just wondering whether they, these surveys are already there. Yeah, they've already been okay. written. Yeah. Um, however, they were written with international campers in mind hmm. uh, but i need to revisit them basically because i think maybe they need to be tweaked slightly so that they relate to the context of the people the bolivian people that are doing this work yeah. um so I'll send you the surveys and then maybe together we can take a look at them another time um, soon in the next few weeks, maybe, and decide whether we think they are relevant for that context or whether we need to rewrite them. OK. Or I can. Just yeah, I, yeah, maybe. I mean, uh, of course, we can do that. I'm not sure whether they would actually play or not because I haven't been there. So maybe yeah. Manny can help with that. We can do that later. And just to say that I can also like translate. If you don't have them in Spanish, maybe you have them in Spanish because of the camp in Spain. So that's not needed. But if not, I can translate them as well, of course. Okay, fantastic. 
uh, yeah, let me look into it and I'll get yeah. back to you. Sure. And uh, report. Ah, okay, I can see now that there is a report template document. Yeah, right. I've added it. <laughs> okay, that's great. It's the last time. Um, so I will send that to you as well. So in terms of time, I'm just trying to address my last questions before uh, I, because I have to leave. Um, so, okay, there is the, the template report ah, regarding time. So I saw that one of them, maybe the one that will take the longest is the, the underwear test because it says 60 days, but for the rest, uh, how much time do you think it will take me to have all this like to collect the, all the samples, do all the tests, like roughly just to have an idea. I think the man would like to know that or wanted to. Uh, <clears throat> it depends if you're doing it every day or if you're also doing other activities whilst you're there. Hmm. Um, but we normally say just to be on the safe side, you should be there for three months. Um, because it is, a fair amount of work i mean each test will take a few days for each stage probably mm. by the yeah. time you've located the sites you've marked them um both on the google map and on the ground uh yeah it is possible to do it quicker but we don't want to send people out there with all of this training and then have uh, them leave too early and the tests are not completed. Okay. So yeah, three months max, two months minimum, I'd say, between two and three months. Okay, and with like, how much time do you think it would require, uh, like let's say per week or like hours per week? Would you, would you have an idea, I mean? If... Uh, I think that's a question that you could ask to Sarah and Michaela. Okay. The two data collectors that are there at the moment. Um, Cause it's just all, it's all quite abstract for me because I haven't collected this data before. Okay. Um, I've been a part of seeing Cedric do it at Vera Organica, but it has evolved since then. So all of these tests together, um, no one has yet collected them all okay so but Michaela and Sarah will and I can connect you with them via a zoom call maybe in like a couple of weeks time and uh, you can ask them that those sorts of questions yeah sure sounds good yeah I, I just wanted to have an idea because uh, I also would like to tell men or be clear about how much time this would require me so oh, with how much time he can count like uh, with me for other uh, activities. So that's basically it. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Um, cool. Thank you for your time. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Yeah. I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>